Hello everyone, I welcome you all to this video presentation on the topic The Hungry Tide, a novel written by Amita Ghosh. I am Dr. J. Nandini, Assistant Professor of English from the Standard Fireworks Rajaratnam College for Women, Sivahasi. Before I get into the novel, let me brief about the author. Amitav Ghosh is a very prominent post-colonial writer. He is an emigrant whose roots are in West Bengal. His novels are set in the colonial and post-colonial times, bringing into focus some of the prominent political and social issues prevalent in that geographical location. Amitav Ghosh also attempts to bring into light the voice of the subalterns that are constantly suppressed or ignored. The novel that I have taken for study today, The Hungry Tide, is set in the Sundarbans. The story revolves around a historical event, the Morijapi massacre that happened in the year 1979. The novel is also set in a non-linear narrative pattern oscillating between the past and the present. Nature plays a very important role in the novel. It has a kind of supernatural presence, both life-giving and destructive. There is a historical event which is at the center of the novel. During the partition of Bangladesh, refugees entered India. These refugees were not allowed to settle in West Bengal. When they attempted to settle in Morijapi, which is a small island in the Sundarbans, they were forcefully evacuated by the police. This resulted in police brutality, violence and numerous deaths. The death count remains unknown till now. This incident is at the crux of the novel. Human lives are constantly under threat from nat various natural calamities as well as animal attacks in Sundarbans. Amitav Ghosh adds to this a mystic vibe by bringing in mythical elements. The mythology that surrounds the tiger shows how these native people perceive nature. Tigers might be the pride of India, our national animal, a very protected species that is on the verge of extinction. But these people view it as an evil spirit that constantly threatens their lives. They also believe that only those who are of pure of spirit will be protected against tiger attacks. Greed and insolence might lead to death. There are three central characters in the novel, Kanai, Pia and Fakir. All three of them are from different social hierarchy. Kanai is the modern Indian, a self-made man who is well educated and financially well off. In a sense, he represents all of us people who are living a privileged life and they do not care or understand about the plights of the downtrodden. Kanai also has a sense of entitlement and a slight superiority complex. In the introduction itself, when he introduces himself to Pia, he boasts that he knows six languages and can detect various accents and dialects. The next character is Pia. Pia is a truly liberated woman who lives by her own standards. She pursues her passion which is her research on the Gangetic Dolphins. She cares zero percentage about the patronizing or judgmental behavior of others. She has come to India to do research on the Irrawaddy Dolphins. She is also very intelligent and quickly perceptive. Pia is the representative of the Western ideology of conservation. She stands for wildlife conservation even if it poses threats to human lives. In the beginning itself, Pia understands that the government approved procedures will not be adequate for her research and she turns to Fakir, a poor and illiterate fisherman who is also a source of abundant information. In the end, only through Fakir, she gets the opportunity to know Sundarbans and its ecological system better. The next character in the novel is Fakir, who I already mentioned is a poor, illiterate fisherman who is looked down upon and exploited by others. When he is introduced, Ghosh presents him in an obvious position of disadvantage, a poor fisherman who has transgressed into forbidden waters. The officers are predatory and they exploit the opportunity and demand bribes. The poor man with sunken cheeks and malnourished physique offers money with a disturbing sadness in his eyes. In his own home, Fakir is not respected. His wife Moina is more educated than him and she does not 
value him because fishing does not enable him to be an adequate financial provider for his family. Kanai constantly lords over him and shows off his privileged status and entitled behavior. In the patriarchal social setup, a man's success and worth is measured by his financial capabilities. Fakir is also the son of Kuzum, who is a victim of the Morijapi massacre. There is a sort of romantic interest between the leads. Kanai is interested in Pia, but Pia develops a warm friendship with Fakir. But their relationship is platonic. Moina suspects that there is more to their relationship and she wants Kanai, who leaves no stone unturned, to put Fakir in his place. The three of them, Fakir, Kanai and uh, Pia, they are interlinked because Pia seeks Fakir's help uh, for her research. Uh, and uh, because they do not know each other's language, uh, Kanai uh, offers to help them. He actually works as a translator between uh, Pia and uh, Fakir. It is very interesting where to uh, Am Amitav Ghosh uh, takes this love triangle. At one point, uh, Fakir decides enough is enough and he decides to teach a lesson to Kanai. Fakir challenges Kanai to enter, enter an island where they have seen fresh tiger footprints. In false bravado, Kanai accepts the challenge, but his courage evaporates when he actually encounters a tiger. Kanai might know six languages and earn more than Fakir, but none of that will help him survive an impending tiger attack. His limbs grow clammy and he loses all sense of direction and runs for his life. This is a very good example for Bhaktin's carnivalesque. The social hierarchy is collapsed. The oppressor becomes the oppressed and vice versa. Fakir proves that his life experiences will come in handy for survival in the wilderness than Kanai's institutionalized education. There is another instance of carnivalesque at the end of the novel after Fakir's death. In the final scene, Ghosh presents Pia and Moina with a strange physical resemblance. Pia is a liberated woman who is not bound by the shackles of patriarchy, whereas Moina is her opposite. She puts up with her husband whom she does not respect just for the sake of conventions. In the end, the differences shatter. Ghosh presents this through the similarity in their appearance. Pia was wearing Moina's sari because she has lost all her clothings and Moina is in a short haircut because she is a widow now after Fakir's death. Pia seems to gravitate more towards her roots and Moina feels inclined to strive for liberation. They also seem to develop a truce of peace overcoming their rivalry over Fakir. In the novel, Amita Ghosh makes a very strong statement about the western ideal of conservationism which advocates excluding the natives from their environment. But this idea is completely destructive. According to Vandana Shiva, an eco-feminist, the act of conservation should be participatory. That is, the natives and their knowledge of the environment is a great asset that should be utilized properly. And this can be done only by inclusive methods of conservation. Ghosh propagates a similar attitude towards conservation that is inclusive of the poor natives who are also part of their en uh, environment. With that, I have come to the end of my presentation. Uh, let me conclude with a reference to a movie that I happened to watch recently, Sherni, which is a Hindi movie. This revolves around the same theme of man-animal conflict. The director sympathizes more with the animal's plight than its victims. But still, the movie makes some very valid points. The natives are often pit against the animals, creating the impression that both of them pose a threat to each other. But in reality, both of them, man and animal, are victims and are used as pawns by those who are in power. With that, I have come to the end of my presentation. I hope you found the video useful. Thank you.